Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, let's talk about food, low-carb, high-fat, counting protein for dosing insulin. There's a lot to keep in mind here, and it's not as simple as reading a label and measuring a dose. And I think healthcare professionals suggest the notion that carb counting is some easy thing to do. And the reality is that it absolutely is not. Really accurate carbohydrate counting is one tough job. Dietitian and certified diabetes educator Hope Warshaw takes us through the most recent research about eating well with diabetes and talks about food labels as well as not getting fooled by a one-size-fits-all approach. In our Community Connection this week, a book about automated insulin delivery is already a big addition to the We Are Not Waiting community in more ways than you might think. And tell me something good, some exciting one-year milestones, and a small act at a Starbucks makes a big difference. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm so glad to have you along. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. You know we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. And my son, Benny, was diagnosed with type 1 right before he turned 2. He is now 14, going into high school this fall. And we are back from a great trip to the beach. He and I uh, went away, just me, him, and a friend of his. Uh, my husband and my daughter did a visit to her college. She's going away in the fall. So we kind of split up last week and did our own things. And the beach is great. It's really one of those places where I feel my blood pressure go down as soon as my feet hit the sand. My husband and my daughter don't feel exactly the same way about the beach. So this worked out very well. And of course, one of the issues when we're in the ocean is keeping everything on, all the gear. And I will tell you, this is not a commercial, that the stay put product is really the only thing that helps Benny keep his gear on. And this happened last summer too. I talked about Stay Put. So I'm going to link them up in the show notes. But a huge thank you to Mike over at Stay Put because because it really is just an amazing patch for us. It goes right over the Dexcom. I didn't even put skin tack or anything else underneath the patch, which I have done in the past. I think it stays better without it. And Mike, yeah, you were right about that. You told me that last year, but I didn't believe you. So you can say, I told you so next time I see you and maybe at the Friends for Life conference coming up. But we just put it on with nothing under Underneath it, and it kept it on for the full 10 days of the, the sensor and a couple of days more. I will put a link in the show notes and talk a little bit more of that in the Facebook group. <clears throat> but yes, uh, FDA approved for 10 days, but we do have the stay put over the sensor right now. And as I'm taping this, we're on day 13 of the tape. And I think the sensor is actually a couple of days longer than that. So a huge thank you to stay put. It is a summer essential for us. I don't know about you at the beach, but when I'm watching the kids, you know, you're making sure if you're not in the water with them, everybody's safe, everybody's okay. And I'm always looking, okay, there's Benny. Come on, I want to see your arm. Like, come on out of the water. Yep, Dexcom's still on. Okay, keep swimming. <laughs> I'm just always checking like that. Oh, it's so ridiculous, but you know what I mean. We did have one thing at the beach, actually on the way home from the beach, that I want to share with you. Definitely not a perfect parenting moment. Haha, <laughs> far from it. But I will share that at the end of this show. It is a rather long story. And uh, I know you want to get to all the food stuff. So I will share that towards the end of the show. Let's put it this way. It's really important if you take long-acting insulin that you remember to take your long-acting insulin. So more on that in a bit. Also want to let you know that this is what we call an extra show, which means that the interview you're going to hear with Hope Warshaw coming up is actually an excerpt of the interview. The full interview will air as a bonus episode in just a couple of days because it's a longer interview and some people just really like hearing the shorter version. Some people like hearing the longer version. And we are making transcriptions available of all of these extra episodes every month. And all you need to do to get that is to sign up for the newsletter. 
That link is in the show notes as well. You can find it at diabetes-connections.com or in the Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group. The transcription that is going out for this month is all about getting diabetes organized with Susan Weiner. That is all about how to keep your supplies organized, get your schedule, your doctor's appointments, your paperwork organized. She is the master. And I was really excited to be able to offer a transcription of our episode. So you can just read the interview and we're going to offer a new one of those every month. But it's for newsletter only, not social media. All right, we will talk about food in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneTouch. And for seven years, OneTouch Vario test strips have delivered reliable results you can trust. And did you know they have the lowest copay on the most health plans and are always covered on traditional Medicare Part B? To upgrade today to the OneTouch Vario Flex Meter, visit diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneTouch logo. Coverage and payment may be subject to co-insurance, deductible, and patient eligibility requirements. LifeScan does not guarantee coverage or payment. We talk a lot on this show about technology, but I wanted to make sure to talk about food. I mean, it's kind of low-tech. But when you think about it, of course, what we eat affects our bodies, and certainly what you eat affects your dosing of insulin, affects your diabetes, and all that good stuff. So I wanted to really try to just uh, dial down a little bit and do a longer interview about guidelines, about how we eat, how the experts come to those conclusions, and you know, kind of what we can take out of it. I did get an email. I had spoken about this. I had kind of teased this episode, and I got an email from some international folks who reminded me that food labels are different around the world. And to please not get too specific and talk too much about just the USA food labels, particularly with added sugars and fiber. Uh, you know, We're going to talk about subtracting fiber. If you do that, some people do that when they carb count. We don't. But there, there were a lot of questions about international labels. We didn't get quite that specific that I think you need to worry about it if you are listening in another country. And I'm thrilled that we do have such a great international listenership. I mean, that's amazing to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. But it is a U.S.-centric show because as a layperson, I can only really talk about my experience, and my experience is here in America, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So with that caveat, I will say I think it is general enough that you, as you listen in Australia or the UK or Canada, or if you're an English speaker in a different part of the world, I think you'll get a lot out of it. I don't think we got too specific, but I do appreciate those messages, and I want to let you know that I heard them. All right, my guest this week is Hope Warshaw. She is a dietitian and a certified diabetes educator. She has her own consulting practice. She is a an author of many books. Uh, she is particularly well known for her expertise in diabetes nutrition management and healthy restaurant eating. Uh, she has been the president of the American Association of Diabetes Educators, and she is recently back from the American Diabetes Association scientific sessions where they did talk about nutrition. So let's get to it. Here's my interview with Hope Warshaw. Hope, thank you so much for spending some time with me. A lot of ground to cover here. Thanks for jumping in on this. Delighted to be with you. All right, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is are these new consensus updates. The American Diabetes Association published a new guidance report recently about individualizing uh, nutrition goals in diabetes care. And what sticks out to me is that they say there is no single recommended nutrition plan for people with diabetes. So what do we do? Can we just start from that recommendation? Sure. Let me just take you back a little Please. bit. History. I've been around a long time. <laughs> This recommendation is really consistent with what the American Diabetes Association has said for a number of years. So there have been what have been called position statements or and nutrition recommendations over the years. ADA it has moved recently to more doing consensus reports rather than position statements, and these consensus reports are all wrapped into their standards of care, which are published annually in January. And then updates are done in what they are now calling their living standards. So I would say for a number of years at this point, the message from ADA in terms of nutrition and really what to eat has been individualized. As you and I know very well, there are 30 million people 
diagnosed with diabetes in the U.S. It happens that for the first time, these nutrition guidance, this nutrition guidance includes both people with diabetes and the 84 million people that CDC estimates has prediabetes. So it's an awful lot of people. And the research just doesn't bear out that there is one eating plan that people with prediabetes and every person with diabetes, whether it be type 1, type 2, or other types, there are many other types of diabetes, that there's one type of eating plan to follow. So this is nothing new and revolutionary. I guess it seems revolutionary to me in that this is more, you know, you should eat in a way that you can you can do, but that, and they do say this in here, that results in a, a deficit of energy, right? So you want to promote weight loss. You want to focus on the things that I know you know, and they're so rote to, to folks like you in the know, more vegetables, minimizing sugars, you know, choosing whole unprocessed foods. But a lot of us are looking for a plan. So if I go to my nutritionists or my uh, endocrinologist as a parent of a person with type 1 diabetes, what are some things I should be asking about in terms of eating well based on these new guidelines? I mean, do I walk in and say, give me a plan that works for me? I mean, so let's step back a second. I do not believe that given real life today that people follow, let's just call them diets. Okay. People don't do that. People need, I think, much more of a skeleton of what their approach may be, what some goals should be about the way they choose foods and put meals together. And that's why I think that, I mean, there's never a why (laughs) with these kind of consensus reports. It's always based on research. I mean, when you dig into the details of this consensus report, you know they went through, you know, 600 pieces of research. They have particular exclusion criteria about the research that they considered looking at and that that they did not. There were, I think the number was 15 experts in nutrition. A number of them are my longtime friends and colleagues. And this came together, this is all research-based. So to read through, and I think it's a value to read through, one of the messages is that healthcare providers should focus on key factors that are common among the healthful eating plans. And those are, and you listed a few of them, emphasize consumption of non-starchy vegetables. Translated, that means load your plate with raw and cooked non-starchy vegetables. Number two, minimize consumption of added sugars and refined grains. So refined grains, your white breads, your white pastas, your cookies, your pastries and baked goods that are made with white flour. Added sugars, the biggest contributor of added sugars to the American way of eating is what we consume in beverages. Number three was choose whole foods over highly processed foods. And the fourth one sort of goes along with the second one, but that was replace sugar sweetened beverages with water as often as possible. So the point here is that those can be some some core principles that people work towards. And the reality is that those core principles are no different than for anyone else without diabetes trying yeah, to eat yeah. healthier today. So when, when we look at this and they talk about individualization and there's no single recommended plan and everything you just said, one of the things that comes up time and time again is whether we should be eating low carb or, and I've seen more recently, a differentiation between low carb and very low carb. Is there anything in this report that says that low carb or very low carb is better than an everything in moderation plan? I would say you 
in looking at the research and looking at this consensus report, you really need to split out type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes. And let me just give you definitions because okay. this was one of my tweets at the ADA meeting was when we use these terms, low carb, high carb, low protein, high protein, can we please put a number on it? Because yeah. It doesn't do any of us any good to just be thrown around these terms without full understanding. And there's no higher being out there that has ever really said this means this and that means that. But for the purposes of this review, um, a low carbohydrate eating pattern was defined as 26 to 45% of total calories. So that is low carbohydrate. They defined very low carbohydrate as less than 26% of total calories. So I think that's important to understand. Can I jump in, Hope, and ask you, I, I don't know if you can translate this. Can you translate that to carbs per day? Right back to Hope answering that question. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. We have been using the Dexcom G6 for more than a year now. It came out early last summer. It is amazing. The Dexcom G6 is FDA permitted for no finger sticks for calibration and diabetes treatment decisions. You know, you do that two hour warm up and the number just pops up. Uh, you know, I'm still getting used to that. You know, it seems like magic to me after so many years of uh, having to calibrate and finger stick along with that warm up. We've been using the Dexcom for more than five years now, five and a half years, and it just keeps getting better. The G6 has longer sensor wear now 10 days. And the new sensor applicator is so easy to use. Benny does it all himself now. He says it doesn't hurt. Of course, we still love the alerts and alarms and that we can set them how we want. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now back to Hope. I have just asked her if she can give us guidelines of carbs per day. I can only do that given a certain number of calories. I see. Okay. You can't say grams unless you know the calories. And what people often don't understand, and I don't blame them because nutrition is a lot and confusing, um, but the reality is because foods are, as I call them, packages of nutrients, either in combinations of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And if you are going to eat, say, very low carbohydrate, then to get the calories that you need, you're more than likely going to be eating a good bit of protein and fat because you got to get your calories from somewhere. So I would say the, the body of literature is getting stronger for the value of low carbohydrate eating plans for people with type 2 diabetes. Does that mean that is the only way for people with type 2 diabetes to eat? Absolutely not. Um, And the paper does a very nice job of reviewing the literature on eating patterns. Mediterranean eating styles covered vegetarian or vegan, low fat, low carb, etc. So there's actually a fabulous table that covers a lot of that that I'm sitting here reading off of with all of those numbers. In the area of type 1 diabetes, there is actually very little if not no high quality research done around low carbohydrate or very low carbohydrate eating plants. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I, I say that <laughs> I'm, because I'm it, talking about research. Right. right. 
right. well-conducted research. I mean, we hear so much, Stacey, about nutrition and we hear headlines and, you know, we hear different people's advantage points promoted, but I'm talking about research. And I'm going to quote, because I actually wrote an article for, for my dietitian colleagues that will be in a magazine called Today's Dietitian. And I'm going to quote my colleague who was on the committee who's had type 1 diabetes for, oh my gosh, I think at least 40 years. She wrote, and this is, I'm quoting her in my article. (laughs) She said, we always have to remember that research in people with type 2 diabetes cannot be automatically translated to type 1 diabetes. They're two very different disorders. Okay, so let me ask you maybe, then this is a bit of an editorial question. I have sure. not been in the community, I mean, I've been in the community for 12 years now. Mm-hmm. Why, do you, why do you think there isn't more research on overall diet and type 1 diabetes? Or is it just low carb? It just seems to me that when carb counting was introduced, that they would start following the amount of carb. Okay, and how but, it, yeah. Go ahead, hit me. So, well... I mean, I think it's important to understand that carb counting is a way of meal planning. You can use carb counting to consume a high intake of carbohydrate or a lower intake of carbohydrate. It is not, there's nothing about the term carbohydrate counting that indicates, oh, that means low or very low carbohydrate. Oh, of course, of course. But what, I mean, my, right. I guess my question okay. is, why hasn't it been, I guess my question is, is it just that there are not enough people with type 1 to study the nutrition? I'm curious why, when carb counting sure. is part of how we dose insulin, why there isn't more study right. on the amount of carbs in our carb counting routine and whether it matters. Right. Unfortunately... There isn't nearly enough nutrition research in general. Okay. Nutrition research is very hard to do um, because it's humans, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's what they eat. And to control for one variable means that you may be having people, you know, eat differently than they tend to eat. And you know, it's one thing to put people in. A controlled research center, but it's another thing to have what researchers call free living environments. And while there certainly has been a decent amount of nutrition research over the years, the number of subjects and studies tend to be relatively small. Um, the the duration of the studies tend to be relatively short. Um, and you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that compare this to the research that comes out of the pharma industry. Mm. I mean, I look at some of those studies, like a number of studies that were reported out at the ADA meeting. They are international studies. There are thousands of people in these studies. But you look at the price tag on those, they're millions. So I think we're bringing up an important point for your listeners to understand. It's so much to talk about. I know I could keep you here for hours and hours, but I'm going to kind of zip through a few topics if I could. Sure. One topic that comes up quite often, and there's a lot of confusion here, is net carb. And net carbs come about, in my opinion, because there's a lot of advertising on packaged products. And I know this is more geared for people with type 2, but a lot of people in the type 1 community eat these products and and look at these in the store and and wonder about it and how to dose insulin. It'll say like, oh, only, you know, there's 20 carbs, but only two are digestible. So, you know, what does that mean? And, And if we're using insulin, what should we be doing to count or discount it? So, firstly, it's worth noting that FDA over the years has written some letters saying they're not going to make a decision about net carbs and that they're not going to come after companies that use 
that wording in their advertising. Notice that that is not on the nutrition facts panel. And I think if, if entities did that, that might get in FDA's craw. If there's a significant amount of quote unquote net carbs, I think you could maybe subtract maybe half of the half of that amount from the total grams of carbohydrate in the serving. But for the most part, when we're talking about fiber, really since 2014 ABA nutrition, and they were called recommendations at that point, the recommendation was made to not worry about subtracting fiber. So let me ask you what I I think is going to be a frustrating question for you, and you feel free to throw your hands up at me. I'm going to go back to the low carb and very low carb. But I can (laughs) <laughs> I can't hit you. <laughs> no, no, but you can just, you know, gesture. Oh, Stacy. But I want to go back to the low carb and very low carb discussion we had earlier. And, and just to, sure. cause it's so popular right now and, and people have so many questions. I personally, when I hear those, I think, and I, I just, I'm curious if this is ballpark at all. When I think of very low carb, I think of fewer than 30 carbs a day. And when I think of low carb, I think of fewer than, you know, 70 to 90. Low carb for me, the second one is something like fewer than 30 carbs per meal. And very low carb is 30 carbs per day. Well, I guess my question is, you know, for people with type 1 diabetes. I know. Well, let's, I mean, let's just look at your son. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm laughing because yeah. not low carb. Hello. I mean, he's probably at or near the peak of his energy needs ever. And for for context, for context, if you're a new listener, he is 14 right. years I mean, old. So, He's about 5'10 you know, right now. He's a big dude. Exactly. And I'm 4'10 and <laughs> fight to keep my weight where it is. So you can't talk gram. You, you have to talk in relative terms to that person and to the amount of calories we need. I mean, you're reminding me of a story that I tell often that I was giving a talk. I think it was in Maryland. And I just said, I'm four foot 10. And there was an endocrinologist who happened standing next to me when I was asked the question of how much carbohydrate should I eat Mm. by someone in the audience. And so here's this endo who's like six foot five standing next to me. And I just said to the person, Do you think that doctor, I forget his name, but, and I need to eat the same amount of carbohydrate? It's just not logical. We we need to think more about what we're asking. But I guess this gets to the frustration that we as lay people have in that it is so much easier for me to count carbs and limit to a certain amount a day than it is to say, all right, well, how many calories do I think I need? And then I'm going to divide that and figure out what percentage of carb I should be having during the day. And I'm not trying to make light, but you do understand that. That's why I think a lot of this gets very popular because it seems more simple. Does that make sense? Well, I think that certain ways of eating almost have their magical properties to them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And for people with diabetes, we're also talking about glucose control. And I'm a fan of having people obviously work with a dietitian. I mean, you shouldn't have to be figuring this stuff out on your own. You should be having some sense of what's optimal for you based on how you talk about the way that you want to eat. You know, if someone comes to a dietitian and says, I am vegan or I want to move towards eating more vegetarian, that is something that they should work out some kind of plan. They should have a sense of, well, how much carbohydrate to shoot for at meals based on their calorie needs. So I'm not saying people need to figure it out for themselves. 
I'm concerned with the current situation with the sort of general population popularity of the keto diet and people with diabetes in general having the notion that they need to eat very low carbohydrate. All right, well, let's get into it. I'm glad you brought that up. And the keto people are going to yell at me no matter what we say. So that's okay. It, I'm good with it. I'm We're right used it. to being yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have to say, the people that I know who, quote, do keto and post about it seem to be doing so well with their type 1 diabetes. It really has seemed and, to help and them. And when you're so- saying well, you mean solely glucose control. Right. I'm jealous of their graphs. I I think their weight loss is amazing. They seem really fit and happy. So what's the problem? What are we not seeing? Well, I mean, I'm a little confused about the profile of the person that you're describing, because I think when I think of someone with type 1, I understand the glucose profile. I'm not quite clear on the weight picture. I'm concerned that we're getting too glucose centric. And I, you know, while I think CGMs are phenomenal, it's a lot of data. And I have some concerns about the way all that data may be encouraging people to eat and what foods they may be eliminating as a means to almost have these straight lines in terms of glucose control. And the reality of the matter is, I mean, you know, I don't have diabetes. My post-meal glycemia, it goes up and down. Maybe it's a baby roller coaster compared to what Some people may look at as a giant roller coaster. But one of the concerns I have is, I mean, a few concerns. One is healthiness of, and and I don't think I'm talking about low carb as I define it, but perhaps more very restrictive, you know, almost eating no carbohydrate. Right. And what food choices are people making. If their calories are coming from avocado and nuts and white fish, but if they're coming from ribeye and bacon and sausage, is that necessarily a healthy thing? And are we making people unnecessarily rigid? And are we potentially removing the enjoyment of food? Yeah. I mean, to me, at its base, food should be enjoyed. Food in our lives and in our world is social and ever more so than it's ever been. So those are some of my concerns. And, you know, if you go back to like the DCCT data from the Mm. the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, I mean, I think a big message from that was really keeping those glucose levels, you know, between 70 and 150 on a day in, day out, having A1Cs of that 7% or, you know, a little higher, a little lower, taking that overtime vantage point, then that seems to help delay complications. I think that message of let's keep our eye on the bigger picture. I think that's great advice. And I try to do that every day and, and uh, try and fail, but try and succeed. Right. Maybe Am next I time. saying that's easy? No, <laughs> I have not walked in the shoes of a parent with type one diabetes. I haven't attempted because I haven't had to, to manage type one diabetes. I have huge respect and admiration for so many parents, for so many people that I know who manage this incredibly challenging disease. But with that said, I think from what I see, I think, and given all the research, I think 
keeping the your eyes on that bigger picture is some sage advice. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time here. I, you know, I thought maybe we'd go really specific and nitty gritty into labels and research and the numbers, but this was a terrific conversation. I think really helpful. I know it helped me. Hope, thank you so much for spending so much time with me today. It's always a pleasure. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. More information about a lot that we talked about there. I'll link up to some of the studies that Hope mentioned. I'll do that in the show notes. You can always go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the episode to learn more. And remember that the full interview, thats that was just an excerpt, the full interview will air in a bonus episode in just a couple of days. In our Community Connection this week, we're going to talk about a new book called Automated Insulin Delivery by Dana Lewis that is a bit more than a do-it-yourself guide. Community Connection is brought to you by Tandem. And, you know, we started using the basal IQ feature on the T-Slim X2 insulin pump late last summer. I'm amazed at how well it's worked for us. Uh, the system uses data from the Dexcom G6 CGM. And after all this time with treating lows, I mean, we are 12 and a half years in. We've had to learn to look at blood glucose differently. To find out more about Benny's Pump, just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Tandem logo. If you listen to this podcast, you are likely familiar with Dana Lewis. She is one of the creators and founders of the open source artificial pancreas system, usually referred to as Open APS. We've interviewed her a couple of times. She was a trivia question in our game show episode last year. But, you know, Dana is also a prolific writer about all of this. Uh, she spent the past five years writing uh, dozens and dozens of blog posts about firsthand experiences. She has presented peer-reviewed papers, and now she has put a lot of this together in a book. It's called Automated Insulin Delivery, and in it, she explains what that is. She explains how to explain what that is, maybe to your healthcare provider or to your family, and she has stories, examples from families, and ways to go about doing this. She's basically rewritten a lot of her blog posts and a lot of the guide posts and now has a book that can really help you understand and then switch over to automated insulin delivery. We talk about a lot of books on this show, but one of the reasons I wanted to put this in Community Connection is because what Dana has done here is it's so very Dana. It's so very, <laughs> we are not waiting. That whole community is pretty amazing. And there are many ways you can get the book. So it's a traditional book. It's a printed book that you can can buy online or perhaps in a bookstore if you ask your bookstore to get it for you. And it's priced so that for every two copies purchased, Dana can donate a copy to a hospital or to a library. And I was kidding around a little bit, but the easiest way to get that is through Amazon. We will link that up in the show notes. There is an ebook format. Of course, I can go to your Kindle or whatever ebook reader, a PDF format, and a website. Now, the PDF and the web versions are free which is pretty amazing when you think about the amount of work that has gone into this. If you do get those versions and you would feel so moved, she's asking that you do consider donating. Any donations will be used to buy more copies to be donated or will go to Life for a Child, which is her charity of choice. And then she's asking that if you are reading the book and find yourself wanting to contribute or knowing something that's not in the book, to go and write more and let her know and suggest additions to the book. And, and, you know, it'll go on from there. It's fun to go back and listen to my first couple of interviews with Dana and her husband, Scott Librand. They created a lot of this together because you can hear that I'm pretty clueless about what's going on, as I think many of us were back in 2014, 2013, some of this had started, but it's really not much further back than that. And it's incredible to think about how much has changed and how many more people are using DIY systems and how many more DIY systems that there are. Now, if you're new to the show, you may not realize I don't use a DIY system on Benny. Benny has decided that he's going to stay with the commercial systems that are out there. He's very happy with what we use, and that is fine with me. I was very concerned for a long time about my technical ability to help him. And now that he's really old enough to help himself, um, he's decided to stick with what we've got. He's very happy with it, and him, I'm happy with the results. He's really doing so well. So I can't question that. But I got to tell you, I'm so excited for all of the DIY systems because I truly believe that these pioneers 
have pushed the commercial systems, have really pushed the timeline, have really shown what can be done, have pushed the FDA, have pushed the insurers who have to cover this stuff, you know, have pushed JDRF and ADA to use their voices too, to show that this community needs more help, needs better stuff. And it is finally happening. So it's really exciting to see. It's not going to stop anytime soon. And if you are at all interested, please jump on in, uh, come into our Facebook group, and we can kind of help you find your way if you're not sure where to go. Or the CGM and the cloud group is another terrific place to be. So congratulations to Dana on a terrific accomplishment. Again, this is a great book. I'm excited to see it out there. I hope you get your copy and we will link it all up at diabetes-connections.com. All right, tell me something good. I love highlighting your milestones, the big or little things that happen that make you smile, that you want to share. And Tell Me Something Good is brought to you by Real Good Foods. And I was just in the grocery store with Benny this morning. You know, back from the beach, there's no food in the house. So we're kind of filling in the cupboards and, and getting ready for the next couple of days and nights. And he asked me to make sure to pick up some of the Real Good Foods pizzas. He likes the Supreme. So we went ahead and got that for him. You know, that to me is a meal. That to him is a snack and I am okay with that. You know, it's lower carb, which makes things easy. It tastes good, which really is the best thing about it. Real Good Foods is available by mail. If you want to see their entire lineup of food, they have breakfast sandwiches. Now they have an Italian line. They have cauliflower crust pizzas that are really crunchy and they have the poppers. Uh, you can see the whole thing online and kind of mix and match as you order, or in your grocery store or Walmart freezer is the best and easiest place to go ahead and pick up this stuff. It's just so easy to find. Find out more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. of fun. Tell me something good stories from the Facebook group. Rachel says, I want to give a shout out to Starbucks in Sun Valley Indian Trail, which is not too far from where I am. Um, when she was ordering, she said, I can't have the sugar of their typical drinks. And Matt, the barista, made the drink and handed it to me. As I walked away, he said, Miss, excuse me, did you say you can't have sugar? Yes, I replied. I need to remake your drink, he said. I used the wrong syrup. And that may seem like a little thing Rachel writes, but when it means the difference between a glucose level of 150 and 450, it is a big deal. I appreciated his honesty and willingness to admit his mistake. And my remade drink was perfect, by the way. Rachel, thank you so much. That is a great tell me something good. If I'm ever in Indian Trail, I will stop in and say hi to Matt. Dennis wrote in, I love this from Dennis. I just got my A1C from my doctor and it is 6.5. Very well done, sir. But then he writes four tests in a row, all at 6.5, one year in total. Isn't that amazing? Just the consistency of it. And then he said in April, the Raleigh JDRF chapter raised $1.2 million at their gala event, which he helped out with. So Dennis, congratulations on all of that great stuff. Another Carolina listener. We appreciate that very much. And then Mike let me know. And actually, Mike tagged me on Instagram for this one. So you can always do that as well as post in the Facebook group. And Mike was really excited because his little guy had a 100% in-range CGM graph for the entire day. Their range is 70 to 180, 24 straight hours. He said it took us just over a year to get there. And I messaged him back because, and stay with me on this one, Mike, this is phenomenal. It's so exciting, right? We used to call that a no hitter. Does anybody call that that anymore when you're in range for an entire day? But when you see a little kid, of course, I had to scroll through his Instagram and he's got twins. You know, they look really happy. I mean, he had a, a post that talked about donuts for diagnosis day. I mean, that's awesome. They they're just look so happy. But I just feel like the dear D mom in me, has to say that I don't really want Tell Me Something Good to be about blood sugar numbers. I mean, I mentioned Dennis's A1C, but that's because it was consistent for the same exact number four times for the entire year. So I messaged Mike, and we went back and forth just a little bit about it. And here's what I really want to share. He also posted, what a weekend, a great picture of his son with his hand in like dinosaur tracks. Who cares about numbers when you get to touch real dinosaur tracks, have a ton of family fun, and get to drive a rover on the moon? Where the heck was this? Health is important, he wrote, and so is happiness. So of course we want the best numbers. Of course we want to all be in range. But I don't really want Tell Me Something Good to become about we were always in range or we were 90% in range on this day or, you know, we were 85 for 20 hours. You know, those are great. And of course, when Benny's high, I get stressed out. When Benny's in range, 
I'm happy. If I didn't admit to that, it wouldn't be honest. But you know what I mean. Share, celebrate the good stuff, but let's not make it all about numbers. And Mike, you know that's not what I think you did here. I'm just using this as an example to say, it's great that you were in range, but I so enjoyed the dinosaur fun and the donuts on diagnosis. I actually enjoyed that even more. So thank you so much for sharing some of your family stuff with us. That is really cool. And I love being tagged on Instagram as well in the Facebook group. So thanks all around. Do you have something that you'd love me to talk about for tell me something good? I mean, I've got that stay put thing that's probably never coming off my kid's arm. But, um, you know, if you've got something that you want to talk about, please let me know. You can also email Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. I have one more story for this week before I let you go. And it's definitely not tell me something good. Well, maybe it is. Uh, all right. It's tell me something stressful because it ended well. But, you know, when I mentioned about Benny being high and me being stressed out. So let me tell you what happened recently. We have had an amazing year, I'll say. I mean, since last August. If you're new to the show, we have had just a phenomenal year in terms of numbers and in-range time and Benny feeling good and responsibility and blah, 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 and all that stuff. So um, I don't share numbers, as you know, but A1C is great. Time and range is where it's never been before. It's just really good stuff. And one of the reasons why is because we are untethered, which means he takes long-acting insulin once a day, as well as getting insulin from his pump. He gets about 50% basal from the shot and 50% from his pump. And then all boluses are with the pump all for corrections and for food. And it's worked amazingly well. Well, you know why it works? Because you remember to take the long acting shot. You know when it doesn't work? When you forget to take the long acting shot. And Monday at the beach, he forgot and I forgot. I'm like the backstop, right? I mean, he's got a reminder in his phone. And I've got a reminder in my phone. Yes, he's very independent, but he is 14 and reminders are good. And now we remember why the reminders are good. But, you know, things happen. And we realized on, I want to say, Wednesday morning that we had missed the Monday shot. We didn't realize it before then. And part of the reason is because Traceba, the long acting that Benny takes, it's really such a great long acting because it stays in your system a little bit longer. So if you miss it for a day, you're not going to notice it right away. In fact, if you miss it for a couple of hours, you can just take it that day and then restart it the next day at your usual time. We were told that there have to be eight hours between the Traceba doses. That's a definite ask your doctor question, but that's what we were told. We missed it completely on Monday. So Wednesday, we started seeing slightly higher blood sugars, just a little bit, you know, the kind that you can maybe get when you're not eating food that, you know, from home, you're eating a little junkier. And then we drove home from the beach that day and travel generally makes his blood sugar go a little higher. So I didn't think much of it, even though on the way down, his blood sugar was like 90 the whole way to the beach. It was awesome. But on the way home, haha, it was not. It wasn't even 190. And we just kept putting insulin in him and nothing's happening. And then we realized around five o'clock, like geniuses, we should be increasing your basal. We should be giving you double the basal from the pump because you're not getting any from the long acting. I mean, You know, you think after 12 years, we would realize these things sooner, but you've been there, right? So we did that. And Benny decided, he said, I'm going to just change my inset just in case. And he was due to change his inset the next day anyway. So kudos to him. Just take that out of the equation. Let's change it. But he was high. I mean, and I don't mean the number. I mean the word, right? When you see that on the CGM, that's just the worst. You're just sitting there waiting for it to come down and knowing it's just going to take forever. And he felt pretty good. He was drinking a lot of water, no ketones. So here's what I did. And I think this was what happens after 12 years of type one, because I don't think I would have done this a year or two in and certainly not with a little kid. At 11 o'clock, I said, I got to go to bed. I'm exhausted. I drove all day. The beach wiped me out. But I'm going to put my phone not only with the alerts, I'm actually going to turn my phone on, right? I'm going to turn the ringer on, turn the volume up. And if you need me for any reason, come get me. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm playing video games. I'm fine. Actually, he was in his room reading. I don't know what that was all about. Maybe he really did feel weird. But he said he would come and get me. Well, I went to bed at 11, fully expecting to be awake most of the night, either battling the highs or really dealing with the crash that I assumed was coming. I woke up at six o'clock. My dog was, you know, in my face as she is every morning, licking my nose. And I looked at my phone and he was 1.30. He had just drifted down at midnight, about an hour after we did all that. And he had been at 1.30 all night long. Huh. Definitely not what I had expected. Was I thrilled? Heck yeah. That was great. And he had done the Traceba on Wednesday, so that was back in his system, and we figured we'd just wait and see what happens now, and I let him sleep. 
So I was really relieved, obviously. I mean, what would we have done, right? If he was high all night, we would have done injections. We would have waited it out. We would have pushed water. We, we, you know, you would have done all the things that you would do. I had juice and crackers and everything ready to go for the crash I really thought was coming. But it worked out beautifully. So a little cautionary tale there about remembering to take your long acting, but also a little pat on the back for Benny for, you know, doing what he needed to do, keeping calm. So what do you think about what I did? Right? Uh, Good diabetes mom? Terrible diabetes mom? I mean, I know a lot of people who wouldn't have slept at all that night watching the Dexcom. And I guarantee a few years ago, I probably would have stayed up a lot later. But I'd love to know what you think about something like that. Maybe I'll put that in the Facebook group. You know, not everything's perfect over here. Ha ha, far from it. (laughs) And I like to share what's going on and what's going wrong. All right, lots more to come. Uh, The next couple of weeks are going to be bananas. Lots of travel. We'll be at Friends for Life. Great stuff going on. And I will keep you all posted through the show, but mostly through social media as well. Please join the Facebook group or follow on Instagram or wherever you are. Twitter is good too. And we'll keep you updated on all the happenings and good stuff that's going on. All right. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan, from Audio Editing Solutions. And thank you for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>